Earth Justice is a national legal nonprofit fighting to protect people's health, to preserve magnificent places and wildlife, and to combat climate change. Visit us at earthjustice.org. Earth Justice, because the Earth needs a good lawyer. wherever you may hail i'm your host john bruni welcome to the focus where we bring you the most thought-provoking and informative current affairs analysis from around the world each episode we invite top experts and analysts to share their insights on the most pressing issues of our time from international relations and global economics to philosophy and science no topic is off limits Join us as we explore the complex and ever-changing landscape of the world where we provide valuable perspectives on the events that shape our global community. Today from the United States, we'll be speaking with co-founder for Campaign for Uyghurs, Rushan Abbas, where we'll update our audience on the plight of the Uyghur people. For those of you long-timers out there, you'll remember that we spoke to Rushan last while we were a radio show on Radio Adelaide a couple of years ago. Gosh, where does the time fly? This is going to be a pretty heavy going topic, but we hope that you enjoy this episode nonetheless. Rushan, welcome to The Focus. Thank you, John. Just to recap, Rushan, for those in our audience who might not be familiar with the Uyghurs as a people, who are they, where are they from, and what are their cultural traditions? Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak with you again and with your audiences. Um, my people, the Uyghurs, are one of the uh, oldest Turkic people, and they originated in uh, Central Asia, and that they have a long history and a uh, glorious civilization uh, in our homeland we call East Turkestan, which is a geographical, historical, and a symbolic name. The word Uyghur itself means um, unity, alliance, in the uh, olden Turkish, uh, Turkic language, actually. We are similar to people. Uh, we have same culture and the same history and the religion and the background is like Uzbeks and Uzbekistan, Kazakhs and Kyrgyz and all the Central, Central Asian uh, republics. The Uyghur language belongs to the uh, Karluk branch of the uh, Turkic language family. And the, it's written and the modified in uh, Arabic scripts. And the uh, Uyghurs are predominantly Muslim. Over the centuries, Islam has widely spread across the East Turkestan. Um, so our culture, Uyghur culture, is um, intertwined closely with uh, like a Muslim culture. Rushan, can you give us an overview of the Chinese government's treatment of Uyghurs, including forced labor, detainment, and cultural erasure? I mean, why are the Chinese hitting the Uyghur populations so hard? Well, the, our country was occupied by the communist Chinese regime in 1949. So ever since the occupation, Uyghurs have gone through periods of harsh policies against our culture, our religion, and our background. Like even during the 50s, Uyghurs were labeled and persecuted under the name of nationalists. And during the 60s, cultural revolution period, Uyghurs were uh, denounced as counter-revolutionaries and which my parents, my grandpa, were the victims of that period. My grandpa was in jail for three years. My father and the mother, both being Uyghur intellectuals, they were uh, periodically always taken away from home and they faced persecution. And then um, uh, basically, after the 9-11 tragedy in the United States, over in uh, 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 Uyghur people in overnight became uh, extremists and the uh, Chinese government claimed to be the victim of war on terror. Under that guise, um, the, uh, the Chinese government is banning our language in schools and the censorship of culture 
and the any kind of uh, historical or uh, ethnical, like you know, the Uyghur identity or anything has anything to do with the Uyghur uh, became illegal. Basically, practice of any sort of normal uh, practice of the religion, the Islam became illegal engagement with uh, like illegal Islamic uh, activities. So now, since 2014, the concentration camps were being built. And the uh, since 2016 and 2017, um, the Uyghurs were uh, faced persecution and detained by the millions by summer of 2017, over 1 million people were detained. And then later, actually, the number grew pretty rapidly. And we had like more than 3 million Uyghur people in the concentration camps. Millions more were sent to forced labor facilities. And they, when the Chinese government claims that those are for uh, unemployment problem in our region and the um, they also claim this is about poverty alleviation. No, these are all complete lies because uh, the, the Uyghurs sent to China proper or any kind of forced labor facilities in our homeland. They are university students or university professors, successful business people, and the people who were working actually. And also with the current atrocities and this active genocide the Uyghurs are facing. Uyghur women's bodies are being the battleground for this genocide is taking place actually, uh, because they are facing forced sterilizations, forced abortions, and the forced marriages, and also institutionalized mass rape by the organized by the you know government, state-sponsored mass rape, because Chinese government itself reported that on the state media, 1.1 million Han Chinese cadres, mostly male, deployed into Uyghur homes, live with them inside of their houses, supervising and the, um, monitoring their daily lives. When most men are sent to the either concentration camps or the forced labor facilities, Uyghur women are subject to sexual abuse inside of their own houses. And also there are reports that um, about the 1 million Uyghur children are taken from their families and sent to state-run orphanages, and they are subject to indoctrination and being raised by like a completely stripping off from their culture, language, their heritage. So um, yeah, to answer your question, John, why the Chinese government does that? Chinese government thinks anything that's different, like the, our religion, the language we speak, the beautiful culture that we have, everything is uh, they take it as a threat to them. When uh, they all they uh, the, the other former ambassador to United States, Tui Tian Kai, when he was here in Beijing uh, about this concentration camps. Uh, came out to the public, one of the reporters, CNN reporter, interviewed him and asked him specifically this question, why are you holding those Uyghurs? You know, they claim those are re-education centers. So asking him why, uh, you know, this many Uyghurs are in the uh, re-education centers. And he just said it bluntly. He said, we are trying to make them normal persons. Can you believe it, John? Mm. Because of our beautiful culture, the language we speak, the religion that we practice, mm. the history that we own made us in, you know, on their vision, in their eyes, eyes of the Chinese Communist Party, the Uyghurs were abnormal commodities for them. You know, it's uh, it's interesting. I uh, recently watched the documentary uh, In Search of My Sister, um, which came out last December. And I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes. So for people who are interested in having a look at that. But, you know, you had a Chinese spokesperson, and it's really quite interesting watching their language. But for those people who are out there in terms of being very agnostic about what's going on in Western China. Can you say something about the 
empirical evidence that you have citing the human rights abuses going forward? Because, you know, China is a totalitarian country. Um, it, it's judicious with the truth at the best of times. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Uyghur people are not free to express themselves whatsoever. And it's very difficult to get direct information from an area that's been basically locked down by the Chinese authorities. So what are the, well, what are the empirical evidence say in terms of, you know, reports, eyewitness accounts, satellite imagery, and so on and so forth to, to back up what you're just saying about the persecution? There has been uh, time after time, Chinese government's own leaked documents mm -hmm. and the camera footages and the satellite footages, you know, satellite imageries. And there was a, a video clip, a drone uh, taken a video clip mm -hmm. and also testimonies from uh, uh, the former camp victims. Mm -hmm. Even one of the Chinese police himself actually, who testified in the uh, Uyghur tribunal in London. So not just the hundreds and the thousands of uh, testimonies from victims and the victims' families. And we also have the last leak was, uh, last leakage was the most recently one was uh, uh, May 2022, the Xinjiang police files were released by Dr. Adrian Zanz and the, the victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, which included leaked photos, thousands of leaked photos, almost 3,000 faces of just one camp, one, one area in Kashgar, mm -hmm. and the documents of thousands of detainees and the weapons and the guards and the uh, policies, actually, the inside of the camps. Yeah. So uh, there are also databases with the names and leaked transcripts of internal memos and the speeches by the CCP officials. So people cannot just try to deny that much evidence. It's not just me being an Uyghur activist sitting in America and talking about this. We are talking about Chinese government's own data analysis, Chinese government's own documents, documents after documents. Um, let me just give you one example of, you know, uh, what the, the, the documentary you saw and how the Chinese government's propaganda and the disinformation and the lies works. And they are getting cut on their own lies in regards to my sister's case. Um, so as you know, my sister was detained six days after my first public speech in September 2018 as a part of transnational repression. Mm -hmm. And then when I carried her picture every place I go and all my social media, I was posting her pictures and I was writing op-eds, publishing in Washington Post and giving interviews for uh, CNN, BBC and the uh, uh, New York Times. Mm -hmm. The Chinese government's mouthpiece, the state media, China Global Times Network published an article said that Rushana Bas stealing other people's photos, claiming it's her missing relatives and spreading lies about China. Then when I quit my full-time job and I became full-time activist and doubling and tripling down my efforts and they speak against the genocidal atrocities. And we heard that my sister was sentenced in 20 years on the sham trial, secret trial on the sham charges, false charges. When we heard that, we did a uh, press conference here at the Hill in Washington, uh, Congressional Executive Committee on China did the press conference. The next day, one of the Reuters reporter asked MOFA spokesperson Wang Wenbin about my sister. Mm -hmm. He just spelled it out my sister's name. He said, Gulshan Abbas was charged, accordance was law, blah, blah, blah. Well, which one? Mm -hmm. Am I the liar? Didn't you say a year ago on your state media that I was making up my sister's story? Mm -hmm. Now you are saying that she is sentenced and you are acknowledging that she exists? So this is just one example of how ridiculous their lies are. Uh, what are the key economic factors driving the Chinese government's actions in East Turkestan? How has the Belt and Road Initiative and the exploitation of Uyghur la labor fed into this? Yeah. 
that is the, one of the main key issue. Why 2014 the genocidal policies accelerated so rapidly? Because 2013, Xi Jinping announced the Belt and Road Initiative in Kazakhstan, yeah. and the, with that blueprint, Xi Jinping's signature project for the world domination put our homeland in the epicenter for this project. Mm -hmm. So our homeland is a major port to the rest of the Eurasia, which makes control over the region extremely, you know, it, it is extremely important for the Chinese government as they build out their Belt and Road Initiative. And the uh, our homeland is basically gateway to Central Asia, Europe, Turkey, and the uh, Middle East and Africa. So when you look at the natural resources, 84%, 85% of China's cotton output comes from our region. And also um, Uyghurs are being used to mine um, uh, critical raw materials such as lithium and the uh, uranium and the polysilicons. And the Uyghurs are effectively free labor for China with this concentration camps and this genocide. And the so many European companies continue to do business with China and the using Uyghur slaves for their supply chains, making this genocide a profitable venture for the Chinese government. Now, Rushan, when we mention cotton, I don't think it's doing justice to the the resource itself, because aren't we talking about a special type of cotton that gives a very silky sort of texture, something that's highly valued by the international markets? I mean, this isn't just something that can be easily replaced by what we grow here in Queensland in Australia, for instance. This is something special and actually uh, geographically bound to East Turkestan in terms of its environmental capacities, yeah? Yes, absolutely. That is one of the key factor. And the, you know, we meet a lot of uh, victims who were taken to the field uh, for years as uh, like a free labor, handpick those cottons. Mm -hmm. um, even if, uh, you know, like high school students, university students, they just take them out from the classroom, send to the cotton fields, make them handpick those cottons. And the, as you said, one of the most silkiest and the most high quality cotton, yeah. which is very rare to the other parts of the world, that is being produced from our region. Do you think that that's actually a vulnerability for China? I mean, I suppose if you look at a, a hydraulic economy, say, for instance, we look at the Middle East and, you know, uh, it's, it's an economy based on the exportation of oil. Is there something about the cotton industry in East Turkestan that is very similar in terms of if you close it down, Beijing will have very little to do. I, I was reading an article only recently that suggested that uh, China is currently facing a period of poly crisis, which means multiple simultaneous crises, economic crises, political crises. I mean, actually, it's really interesting because when, when we, we think of the, uh, the riots that took place recently in China, and I think some are still ongoing in various parts of the country, I mean, uh, with regard to the COVID lockdowns, uh, it all started last November in the Uyghur capital of Urumqi. So it's kind of ironic in a way that a lot of the national agitation against the Chinese government, which is quite mainstream, it's not Uyghur centric, but it came from East Turkestan and spread throughout the country. And this is in spite of the facial recognition technology and the social credit that the Chinese authorities use to control the bulk of the Chinese population. Yes, absolutely. Um, genocide should be our red line. Slavery should be our red line. Yep. And no country, no company should do business with genocidal regime like China. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, as you said, the, you know, the technology and the, uh, um, as of, you know, 2016, China has employed an initiative called the Integrated Joint Operation Platform, the IJOP, Reverse Engineering um, which was, you know, uh, reverse engineering by the Human Rights Watch shows the use of surveillance cameras, facial recognition software, and the um, mobile user data to monitor and categorize Uyghurs. And they use um, 
Fisher Price, um, and the, the Fisher Thermo, actually, sorry, Fisher Thermo is a technology or the, the, um, the company here in the United States, Fisher uh, Thermo, they are actually collecting Uyghur people's DNA samples. So all these companies are being complicit with this genocide. Um, China's war on Uyghurs and on humanity, China's crimes against humanity is blatant. It's basically war on women, on children, on the freedom and democracy, when the Chinese government is manipulating everyone, actually, when you look at it, you know, like uh, um, CEO and the leaders of the, the corporations and the companies and the, the world leaders and the celebrities and the athletes, the, these people and talk show hosts, you know, all these people are usually so vocal against any kind of social injustice. Where are they? when there is Uyghur women's bodies are basically their, their rights to their own bodies are taken away from them while they are facing forced sterilization, forced abortions, when there's genocide is happening, when there are children are taken away from their families, when there is modern slavery is happening, what happened to them? Why are they all quiet? So there is like, um, when you look at the crime, there is the perpetrator of the crime, which is China is the perpetrator of this genocide. And then there's like um, enablers of the crime. So all these companies and the countries continue to treat China leg like a legitimate business partner are the enablers because they are enabling China's economy to murder more people. And when I, you know, when I say all these people are voluntarily giving up their freedom of speech and the freedom of expression and the saying nothing against such a crimes. When you look at it, you know, they are not just giving up their right to speak. They are eventually giving up the freedom and the democracy and the future of this free world that their parents and themselves worked so hard the last 50 years and the 70 years or so to establish. Because right now, John, it's not just the future of the Uyghurs at stake here. Mm. What's at stake is the future of this free world because Chinese government is using our homeland as a testing ground and exporting the surveillance and the uh, you know, police state and all this controlling manipulation to the other parts of the world. Yeah. And the controlling, actually, um, you are sitting in Australia right now. Do you think the academic world universities in Australia free to speak out against the Chinese government's crimes against humanity? Many of them know. Here in the United States, the same. I was invited to Columbia University a couple of years ago to speak. In the heart of the New York, you know, here in America, I went over there in the morning. We're supposed to be like myself and a Hong Kong activist and Tibetan supposed to participate on the panel. When we got there, we learned that panel was canceled because Chinese students protested. So what happened to the freedom of speech? I feel like I was in Beijing University. I was in China. You know, I, I know that we may have touched this uh, in a former conversation, Rushan, but I know that I'm suffering a lot in terms of getting a bit of pushback because I tend to be more about morality and what's right, whereas many of my colleagues are about follow the money. It's all about the money. Don't worry about morality. Morality is something, if we can afford to give you some morality, if we can afford to protect people's rights, we will do it. It has to, it has to come together in that great constellation of profit. And if it if profit doesn't come from backing the Uyghurs, but profit comes from backing China, we're going to just follow the money. It's yeah. it's hard because you know we live in a post ideological environment, as you know, and fighting the good fight, so to speak, is worthless for people who don't value it. And this yes. is the thing that I'm I know I'm fighting because I suppose having grown up 
during the Cold War, <laughs> I tend to, I, st I still tend to have that sort of black and white view of the world. You know, there's a good way of doing things and a bad way of doing things. Mm -hmm. I understand there's always going to be that that grey area that we have to navigate because that's just reality. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you know, there are clear dividing lines in the world from an ideological perspective that we are just not recognizing today because it's yeah. all about the money. You raise the idea, for instance, that Western companies have a hand in what is going on in East Turkestan. Many times when I've confronted some of my colleagues about this, you know, I've said, do you realize, of course, this, is, this means that Western companies are complicit in crimes. Yeah. It just doesn't compute. It, it's, a, it's a difficult conversation to be had in an environment that is ideologically neutral or yeah. dare I say neutered. Yeah, you are absolutely right. When you are when you are explaining this, when you are speaking, what came to my mind is my favorite quote from this all the statesman from um, you know back in Edmund Burke. You have heard his uh, quote: the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Yeah. Because many, many good people doing nothing mm. because of the economic benefits they are receiving from China. Yeah. Because so many companies are complicit, as you said, we are facing this monster today. Um, when you look at what happened during the World War II, when Nazi Germany was building the Holocaust and the, uh, bringing the Jewish people, the world knew what was happening for but years. They continued to do business with Nazi Germany, enabling Nazi Germany's economy to murder more people. Mm -hmm. Then what happened? When Great Britain continued to support Nazi Germany, they suffered by bombers blowing all over London. Mm -hmm. And then later, after the World War II ended, the many people try to claim the ignorance by saying, oh, the information flow was slow and they didn't know what was happening. Also, they knew back then, mm -hmm. but this is information era. This is 21st century. There's so many information out there. And there are countries like United States and the uh, Canada, Czech Republic, Belgium, the Netherlands, France, Lithuania, Ireland, and European Parliament, and the Taiwan even, um, have recognized Chinese Communist Party's crimes as genocide. Yeah. And the, uh, well, we need to see yet, yet to see Australia stepping up and do some tangible actions. But the US also implemented the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. And the uh, now that is uh, prohibiting the import of goods made with the Uyghur slaves, basically. You know what, John, when we were working at the Hill here with our Congress, tried to get that law passed, we had companies like Nike, Coca-Cola, Heinz Ketchup and the others working actively lobbying against, the, uh, against this um, bill so they can continue to make profit of Uyghur slaves' blood, sweat, and the tears. So it's extremely sad to see. For me, you know, I came to the United States in uh, 1989, leaving my parents back home, leaving my friends and my homeland back home. I came here for something that I was yearned for, I was looking for, which was the freedom and the democracy that United States stands. And that's what's at stake. And I am doing this at the cost of my own loving sister's freedom. I'm doing my advocacy today while my sister is paying the price for my advocacy for past four years and five months, to be exact, 600, I mean, 1605 days. And, it, you know, it, it, that's why I am frustrated. I am upset. I am disappointed for the, the mute world and inactivity of so many countries that they, they claim to be, they value the Western democracy and that they are defenders 
of the human rights. I'm John Bruni, and you're listening to Sage International's The Focus podcast, and we're speaking with high-profile U.S.-based Uyghur activist Rushan Abbas. Rushan, do you think that the Han Chinese people have more or less sympathy toward Uyghurs today than they did a couple of years ago? Yes, actually, as you mentioned earlier, the Urumqi fires happened at the end of November 2022, just a, a few months ago. That actually finally made the Han Chinese general public realize this is not as the government claiming that some radicalized people that China is fighting or Uyghurs are taken and the suffering because of China's actions and de-radicalization or whatever that the Chinese government is indoctrinating their population. Finally, they realized the Uyghurs are being victims of China's uh, you know, harsh policies. So they actually protested in the front of the streets like Urumqi Street in Shanghai. And the, uh, immediately we saw some movement among the uh, general uh, Chinese population so we have a saying in Uyghur, you cannot cover the fire with a paper. Um, I think, you know, the people are finally starting to see the Chinese communist regime for what it is and realizing the Uyghurs are being the victims of the China, Chinese government's crimes against humanity. You, you, uh, Rushan, you touch on a very interesting point here, and I'm going to raise a couple of points. Unfortunately, they're not necessarily good ones. Australian Foreign Minister uh, Penny Wong said recently on the United States Air Force shootdown of that Chinese surveillance balloon, and I'm paraphrasing here, we, Australia, want to uh, stabilize the relationship between China and the Indo-Pacific. We will cooperate where we can and we will disagree where we must. Is this not like having it both ways? How does a foreign policy like this assist the Uyghurs? Well, this is, you know, brings back the saying that you cannot have your cake and eat it at the same time. What she's saying is, you know, oh, we don't want to get into tension. Well, China is already at war with Australia. We have seen how the Chinese uh, government treated Australia and with no respect and with humiliation and all these comments made uh, by those wolf warrior uh, diplomats. So it's time to wake up and recognize for China for what it is, you know, to recognize Chinese government for what it is. We have an ample example in front of us with Putin's uh, Russia and Ukraine. That shows us what happens when you continue to appease the dictator. If Australia doesn't wake up, then I would say for the Australian people, read of what is happening to Uyghur people today and remember that because that will be tomorrow for the general public in Australia. That's coming. You know, um, a couple of years ago, we wrote a report on the Indo-Pacific and the strategic dynamics. And one of my jobs was to write the China section. And, you know, one of the, one of the conclusions of the report suggested that China doesn't pose the sort of threat that we in the public domain thinks it poses to us. We tend to look at China as a threat in terms of its military prowess, you know, that China is going to somehow invade Australia. Well, that's kind of impossible under most circumstances, cons considering the fact that there's a huge geographic disparity between where China is and where Australia is in the world. And as far as I can understand, and I think that this is borne out by most of my military colleagues as well, China simply doesn't have the capacity to invade anyone other than countries very close to mainland China for the moment. Now, the problem, of course, with that is that doesn't mean that China doesn't present a threat to a country like Australia. It presents a threat through information operations. It, you know, it has the Confucius Institutes, the long arm of the Chinese state moving into universities. We have, um, you know, cyber threats and various other hybridized and espionage kind of related threats that they easily put against Australia, which can cost us in terms of money. It costs us, us in terms of time trying to counter and push back. But it's not a threat that the general public understand. The, the general public understands 
tanks, they understand warships, and they understand missiles, but they don't understand the more subtle ways of warfare in the 21st century. So I, you know, always say that when we look at China in the Indo-Pacific as an actor, we can't just look at it from a military perspective. It's grown beyond that. Yes, it has a very powerful military, but its reach is narrow. Look at, for instance, how China has managed to dominate the African continent by checkbook diplomacy diplomacy alone and by yeah. debt trap diplomacy alone that's a long way from china they're doing the same thing in latin america they've done the same thing in the middle east as well they've got a strategic footprint it's just not what we recognize as in your face like if for instance you know putin invades uh, uh ukraine or another country in the baltic region you know i mean we can understand that because it's dramatic but all yeah. the other things that the chinese have been doing over the last 20 odd years has been under the radar. It's been very covert. And it's difficult for governments to kick up that much of a fuss because they themselves need the public to support what they're doing. And if the public don't understand it, the politicians don't want to play in that space. And therefore, you have a situation where the Australian foreign minister says these kind of open-ended statements oh no well we want to we want to trade you know we understand that they're not they're a dangerous country but we want to trade with them irrespective because we want stability well okay you want stability there's a price to be yeah. paid for that and we in australia at this moment in time seem to be prepared to play that game uh it's a game that we won't win but it's a game that we want to engage in for some bizarre reason yeah, you are absolutely right. The uh, invasion that China engages with the world, including uh, the Asia Pacific and the, you know, as you mentioned, the Africa and the Middle East and Central Asia, even Latin America and the other parts of the world, it doesn't come with uh, like Putin's tanks and the armed forces and the, with uh, you know uh, marching men, marching. Uh, uh, soldiers, but China's invasion is with smiley faces <laughs> and the suitcases full of money yeah. and saying that it's a win-win situation for both of us. Right. Well, everybody understands there's only one winner and one loser in any games. Mm -hmm. And when they say win-win situation is double win was double win for China mm -hmm. and the other side is always the loser mm -hmm. so we really need to wake up because this is our last chance the united states is naivety for past 40 years thinking that if we bring china to the world uh, trade organization and give them the most favorite nation status and developing their economy and make them strong they will become democratic country like us that failed that failed. And we saw last week um, spy balloon flying all over our sovereignty here in the middle of heartland, middle of the United States. Mm. So what does that tell you, you know? Um, same thing for Australia. It's time for Australian politicians to wake up and wake up and understand the threat, what kind of threat this dictatorship regime is to humanity, to freedom and democracy, because any kind of Western values, the current world order that everybody worked so hard is a threat to a communist dictatorship regime. If we don't hold China accountable now, it will be our children and our grandchildren who will pay the consequences of an illiberal world that we created because we only saw the tip of our nose. We only saw the little bit of economic benefits we are getting from China. So it's dangerous. It's dangerous for the future of this world. And the, uh, it's time to wake up in full speed and understand that China is already at war with any of the Western democratic countries. Okay, finally, Rushan, Turkey. Turkey has been uh, a key country for Uyghurs in that many Uyghur exiles have fled to this country in the hope 
that the biggest Turkish country would be best able to take care of the safety of fellow Turkic peoples. Recep Tayyip Erdogan, Turkey's president, has proven a mercurial ally for the West. Has he been in any better to the Uyghur diaspora community, or does he still condone and encourage the deportation of Uyghurs to countries with close ties to China for their ultimate extradition to the People's Republic? No, actually, we are very happy with Turkey as a country. You know, Turkey has been essential in giving a home away from home for tens of thousands of Uyghurs, for example, you know, in right now, the most recent arrival numbers of the Uyghurs is like 50 to 60,000. Wow. And the uh, is very much an ally of the, the Uyghurs, despite the economic and the trade partnership with China. To date, actually, when you look at it, Turkey is the one and the only Muslim majority country to publicly call out China's crimes against humanity or crimes against the Uyghurs on the world stages, like uh, in United Nations and in the meetings with Muslim majority states, you know, such as the OIC meetings. And the to date, actually, as much as China has been pushing and even doing the vaccine diplomacy last, last time and, and the holding the vaccines uh, because they want Turkey, Turkey to ratify the extradition treaty, but Turkey has not ratified a, any extradition deal with China. So Turkey is our biggest ally, and we look at Turkey as, as our you know, second country, uh, home away from home for us. Well, Rushan, shokran jazeelan, and uh, that for you guys out there is thank you very much in Arabic. <laughs> but thanks for your time uh, with us today, Rushan. And... If anyone wants to know more about what you do, as you are the co-founder of Campaign for Uyghurs, we will have a link in our show notes for those of you in the audience who want to support Rushan's fine work. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Rushan Abbas. Thank you, John. And thank you for tuning in to the Focus podcast. We hope that you found today's discussion to be enlightening and thought-provoking. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to reach out to us on social media. You can find the Focus on Facebook, referenced on the John Bruni and Sage International LinkedIn pages, and on Twitter, or on the Sage International website, www.sageinternational.com.au, by clicking the media drop-down menu and hitting podcasts. And please leave us your comments on inquiries at sageinternational.com.au. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, and or leave us a review on your favorite platform. Join us again next time as we continue to delve into the most pressing current affairs issues of our time. Until then, stay informed and stay engaged. I'm John Bruni, and you've been listening to The Focus. Justice is a national legal nonprofit fighting to save lives, protect our climate, and strengthen our economy through the shift to zero emissions. Visit us at earthjustice.org. Earth Justice, because the earth needs a good lawyer.